All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, this is a session about Drupal.org, obviously, uh, about how it is changing and how it has been changing over the past few months. And we really have three very, very different topics to cover. So Josh and I will go through ours like, really quickly, and then Ryan will talk about Composer, because that's what everyone here for, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> OK. Is here anyone who cares about content? Thank you. You're my favorite people. <laughs> so I will give a very brief overview of um, the content-related changes which are all part of sort of the larger content restructure initiative we have going on on the website. Uh, firstly, to give you some background, uh, last year we developed the overall content strategy for Drupal.org, uh, which sort of includes uh, recommendations on a number of new content types and also on better ways to structure content on the site. So for more information, I won't talk much about that, but you can go uh, follow those links. The first one is my session at DrupalCon, DrupalCon Barcelona. We also had the same session at DrupalCon Los Angeles. And the second link is issue which has like 20 child issues with all the details you will ever want to know. Um, so this year we are focusing on implementing those recommendations which came out of last year's project. So essentially what we are doing, we are restructuring all of the content on this huge website into a new structure, into new groupings called sections. They are based on different types of user activity happening. And behind the scenes, those sections are actually organic groups, uh, which gives us various perks, uh, such as flexibility to have different user roles and different permissions in different sections. For example, some sections could be more of a editorial content, so only specific people can be able to edit it and no one else can. Um, also, we'll be able to display a single piece of content in multiple sections if we want to. Uh, and perhaps we might even use different themes per sections, which sounds crazy. Uh, so at first we wanted to test our assumptions and ideas on some place uh, which is less visible and has very little traffic, so no one could see it. Uh, and so the first section we created was about Drupal.org itself. It is sort of a meta information about the website, various guides, uh, and it primarily is aimed at people who develop Drupal.org or contribute to Drupal.org in some way. And the content is mostly produced by our internal team. Uh, so that section worked pretty well, and then the next one, and the first sort of highly visible one we created was About, uh, which is general information about Drupal and also various uh, promotional materials. Uh, so to create this section, we actually audited all the content in the old About Drupal area, which used like uh, book content type previously. We rewrote most of it, and we recreated it using the new content types we now have. Um, the third uh, section we created was Drupal 8. And this one was created from scratch specifically for Drupal 8 launch last November, which was a fun few weeks. Um, all the content was written from scratch uh, by our communications team with a lot of help, review, and feedback from core people, core committers. And for this section, we went one step further. Not only it has a unique content, it, it is also designed to look completely different from anything else on the website. Um, so to make this happen, we actually created a separate theme, which is only used on this particular area of the site. Uh, again, this is something organic groups let us do fairly easily. Maybe. Yes, Neil <laughs> Um, so another thing we did in the last few months, we introduced a new way of um, communicating information on Drupal.org. Uh, right now we have uh, topical blogs in some of those top-level sections I was talking about. Like, for example, this is a Drupal blog. Uh, it is located inside of About section. And we'll, you'll see more and more of those coming up, uh, coming up in the future. Around the same time, we also introduced um, possibility to follow individual pieces of content. So, for example, you can follow a post in a blog and you will receive email notifications for all the new comments. And this is also possible for forum topics, case studies, uh, and book pages, I think. 
uh, in the future, we're also planning to add ability to follow the blog itself. So you will receive notifications not only for comments, but for the actual new posts via email or via your dashboard, which will be really cool. Um, along with those content changes, we've been also introducing visual changes uh, on the site, and all of them are part of the new design system for the site we're developing right now. You already can see some of them in the header area, in Drupal 8 area, and um, more of them will be coming soon. And by the way, I have those links at the bottom of many slides. Each of them is like a very long blog post about this topic, so if you want to know more, you can always read more. Uh, because we write a lot about what we do. Uh, so speaking of um, features which are coming soon, the next big thing we're working on uh, is a major redesign and improvement of documentation. Uh, in fact, we have a whole sec session about documentation in this very room at 3.45. So if you want to know everything about documentation ever, you should come. Uh, and with that, I will let Josh talk about issue credits. Hooray. It's also going to be a workout. Um, <laughs> the good news is I can talk loud enough that the uh, microphone can probably pick it up. Yeah. All right, there we go. So we're going to talk a bit about issue credits and mark at the marketplace as well. Um, I feel like Tatiana's messing with me because I didn't have the slide in here. So I have to click there. Okay. <laughs> Man. All right, so uh, to start off with, uh, I've gone into a lot of detail to explain a lot of this in a blog post that we did earlier this year. Uh, it's the Guide to Issue Credits and the Drupal.org Marketplace. Um, you know, how we capture those issue credits is, is um, kind of an interesting process. If, if we go back and talk about how it all started, uh, it was a conversation that, that Dries kind of opened up, and, and I can actually remember sitting with him around a table at DrupalCon Austin, and he was talking about this idea of doing commit credits and how we could do a better job of tying commit credits back to organizations that are contributing to Drupal. And if you saw the Amsterdam keynote later that year, he talked a little bit about this idea of the commons, the, the common good that comes out of a public project an open source project like Drupal, and how if we can figure out a way to get people engaged with the idea that giving back to it is of actual benefit, um, then we're going to get greater participation by a wider range of companies. And I, I really wish I'd actually kept the napkin that we were playing with when kind of drawing out what some of this stuff would look like, because it was, it was a great initial conversation. And initially, it was going to be something really simple like, here's the shorthand for it. Um, that started falling apart whenever we started looking at, well, how do you save that shorthand into the database? Because if one person says that uh, they work for the Drupal Association and another person says they work for the DA, they mean the same thing, but they're using two different words. Or maybe just adding Inc. or LLC to the end of a, um, a company name actually makes the idea of doing it based on text formatting and parsing kind of fall apart. And we don't really want to push people to this idea that they have to know short names or that they have to have a special number that they contribute to organizations. We're like, we can probably figure this out with software. Uh, it's, it's kind of what we do. So we uh, basically started with this simpler idea before we released the full issue credit concept. And that was, well, what if just every project could say, here are the organizations that are supporting this module theme, whatever it may be. So we added a very simple p field there. If you are a uh, business owner and you're actively contributing to a module and you have a maintainer on a module, you should absolutely ask them to, to put a little information about the organization and how that organization is contributing back. It's usually time for their developers. It might be money uh, related to contractors. There's a lot of different ways that organizations can actually make a module more successful um, by giving it some resources to make sure that it has the time for support and maintenance and ongoing improvements. Um, the next step after that was, okay, where do we do, and by the way, shout out to the Bear King. Um, <laughs> Brendan, he's on my team, we call him the Bear King. There, there's a story behind it, but I'm not gonna go into it. 
Um, so we, we said, okay, well, if, if we really want people to track how they're contributing, um, the best way to do it is to put it at the point closest to contribution. So in the case of issue credits, what it really comes down to is when you're contributing in the issue queue, you're, there's a comment. Maybe you're uploading a file, maybe you're posting a review, um, maybe you're submitting a patch. All of these things are at the point of contribution. Um, and we added this very simple little interface that basically says, hey, you can attribute this con contribution as a user to an organization. Now, I will say in order for you to associate it to that organization, you're gonna have to take the step of creating an organization profile. Uh, so if your company doesn't already have an organization profile you want to, uh, to contribute, then you need to create one. Uh, there's some spam prevention measures in place that require someone creating an organization profile to have been confirmed, uh, which is one of the tools we use in our community to basically highlight people that are real humans and that are doing something that's helpful for the community. So if you post to an issue queue, it's your first time doing it, it's something helpful, likely someone who's been around for a while is gonna come in, hit the confirm button, and then you would be able to add an organization page or case study or some of these other content types that we have some, some little gates on. Um, after that attribution has occurred, the kind of next step falls to the maintainer. And this is uh, basically at the bottom of any given issue. There's this little widget that lets you see who's participated in that issue and how they've participated. Maybe they've uploaded a bunch of files. Maybe they've made a lot of comments. The maintainer of that project can look at that issue and say, this was valuable contribution. This person deserves credit. And they basically check a box. It remembers that they checked the box. So at any point that they're participating in it, they can save a little bit more metadata. And they keep working along in that issue until the point that it closes. And at the point that it closes, it tallies as a credit in a couple different places. So the steps, again, if you're going to do this, you have to start with the create an organization profile. Uh, to do that, you just go to the marketplace. There's a nice little add your listing button there. Click on that. You're able to go through that process. Um, the users, if they want to be able to add an employer um, that's just kind of always there in their little form, they need to add that organization to their profile. Um, and to do that, it's, it's just part of opening up your personal user profile, going to your current work, um, adding a, a reference to the company that you work for. Uh, right now, we're doing exact match uh, text. An exact text match is what causes that to appear. Eventually, that's going to shift to uh, organic groups as well, so there can be a little bit more maintenance and management by the organization owner as to who actually belongs to their organization. We do occasionally get requests to remove somebody who's moved on to another organization or who no longer works uh, for that organization. I, I should also add one of the cool things with this, this process, it doesn't have to be a company. Uh, one of the biggest non-company contributors is the Drupal Ukraine community. Tatiana's giving a shout out there. Um, they, they created an organization to denote the work that they were doing that they felt uh, was for their community. So it's kind of a cool way to do it. I would also encourage if uh, you're helping to organize a Drupal camp, um, have them create a Drupal camp organization and attribute that as your customer or as the organization you belong to um, as a part of the issue queues whenever you're working at that camp. And you can kind of start, we can start seeing the kind of growth of contribution in that particular location. It'd be a powerful way to use issue credit. So if somebody has a camp, I highly recommend you do it. Um, if you're in the contribution sprints this Friday, attribute the, the, the credits to the Drupal Association. You know, say, hey, this is related to DrupalCon, that sort of thing, um, as a customer, not as an employee. That'd be weird. I'd have to move, remove a whole bunch of you as employees, and I don't want to deal with that. Um, <laughs> So uh, again, the credits uh, are awarded by the maintainers. So that's, that's one of our fail safes in this. It's really hard to game this system. I've seen it happen once in one year. And that person did it accidentally. Like they were actually legitimately wanting to participate, but they were just doing it the wrong way. Um, it's, it's a very successful system so far without a lot of abuse. Um, we only display the last 90 days of issue credits on an org profile or on the marketplace listing or even on an individual's profile, and we have a reason for that. Um, participation is ephemeral. It, it, it has a shelf life. Um, if we only did total credits, then the really big organizations who can throw a lot of money at it would just stay at the top at all times. 
Um, and so by making it a 90 day swing, what we've actually seen are some of these really powerful stories of like say, um, Fachi, which I mentioned in the, in the keynote introduction this morning, who once they found out about it, they started truly contributing back to Drupal.org, making sure that their, their staff knew how to do it. And they rose from obscurity in the organization pages, alphabetized at the time, uh, letter F doesn't get you very far in a, a community as big as ours. Um, they're all the way up to number four. I could say the same thing about ValueBound, which is another organization that's done some amazing work in getting their people to actively say, hey, this is who I'm working for. Those are both relatively large companies. I've also seen companies that just have an incredible spirit of contribution, like say MD Systems. MD Systems is currently number one. They're ahead of Acquia, even though they are, frankly, one, I think they're like 0.5% the size of Acquia. I mean, like this, the, the scale of their contribution is phenomenal. They're just always on top of it. They also have Birder, who frankly is, is a machine, I think. Um, not, not literally, I've met him, he's a nice guy, but I think he might be cyborg. Um, so, those last 90 days, it gives that ability for people to kind of move up and down in scale uh, to show up in the, the top 50 organizations that are contributing back. We've never done a listing uh, of users by issue credits that we do have this data and I do occasionally pull it and you know uh, put out thank yous to people who are doing a, a particular high amount of contribution back that we've never really wanted to create the the grand leaderboard. Um, though I have been tempted with the 90 day kind of concept because it would it would pop around and people would kind of go up and down and you'd be able to see like, hey, they've had a lot of time to contribute back or they had an awesome customer who let them do a whole lot of extra work that, uh, that got contributed back. It'd be kind of interesting to see that stuff, but I understand some of the hesitations there. Um, lots of, oops. Um, again, lots of really fascinating ways to, to, to do that contribution. Um, I mentioned the last 90 days. One of the things, I, I would love a little bit of UI help in this particular area because I, I don't feel like we've quite got this nailed down to what it needs to look like to really highlight organizations quite the right way. But what you see is how many issues they've uh, contributed in the last four months. You see the projects that it was contributed to. Um, you see the issue count. Um, Dries was just telling a great story in the board meeting a few minutes ago about how there was a, a, a company in, uh, in India that came up to him and said, hey, we really want to contribute more. Um, can you teach us how? And he was like, well, why are you wanting to get involved? And he goes, well, the reality is we just lost a couple of projects to companies that have these contribution profiles where they've got all this credit on their profile and they're getting the business and we're not because they're able to show they know Drupal. And I thought, that, wow, that's, that's really fascinating. And it's within a year of releasing this, we're already beginning to see it kind of impact how companies are able to sell themselves as being Drupal experts. And, and so this is kind of a, a powerful way of doing it. I, I, I think this is also really important to that kind of Drupal resume sort of thing. Um, GitHub may have your current streak, um, not the most healthy way to measure your contribution stats sometimes, but uh, GitHub has current streak. We have the, hey, these people really know this stuff. Look at the, uh, the, the types of projects that they've contributed to, which is really powerful. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, this is what the marketplace looks like right now. It's uh, ordered first by issue credits, uh, second by um, first by issue credits, second by whether or not they are a supporting partner of the organization and what level that is. So if if you're giving money back to uh, basically fund Drupal.org, uh, it's it's not giving money to the DA so we can go have fun. It's it's literally empowering us to do things like build tools for collaboration and contribution. It's giving us the ability to um, do things like release the composer uh, endpoints that that Ryan's about to, to talk about. These supporting partner sponsorship programs are, are really key because as a nonprofit, we actually don't make any money off of building these tools. Um, so without a, a business model behind it. Uh, we're, we're encouraging contribution to help strengthen the community and through that we, we get the benefit of, of being able to do it more and that's pretty awesome. So um, help us by giving feedback. There's a, there's a couple of issues out there right now about different ways of contributing. I would love to hear more from people about things that they see that are key ways of doing it. Um, update your 
We're going to do some updates to the organization content type, and I actually have an issue out there right now that's going to remove some of the roadblocks to getting listed. Um, it's one of those processes where right now there's a community review process as to whether or not you show up in, in the list at all. Um, I, I actually believe we should remove that because uh, if you haven't done any contributions and you're relegated to alphabetical, you fall on, frankly, the third or fourth page of the marketplace right now. So there's, there's no reason for us to prevent people from showing, us, showing up on page four. Um, I think there's some questions we can ask about organizations that will help us better identify customers, uh, people who are actually using Drupal for their business rather than uh, selling Drupal services as a business, which is what we're primarily good at right now. Um, and I also think it will give us a way to better track volunteer organizations such, such as the, the Drupal Ukraine community or, um, for example, a Drupal camp um, or a local user group. It, I would love to be able to track more about how those uh, particular organizations contribute and give back and what they do. So please help us on those issues. Uh, if you search the Drupal org um, Q on Drupal.org, it will uh, give you an opportunity to, to weigh in and provide feedback. So that is it, and now we're going to talk about the composer facade. Okay. The facade. <laughs> it's facade. Oh, man. Sorry, I just realized that it's missing the oh, little, yeah, the little curl under the C, which is really hard to type into Google Docs. Like everywhere else, it's a lot easier. You hold down a key. And <clears throat> what, uh, what buttons is the magic one? You have to click the image from that slide. All right. Um, I'm just going to start with a real high level overview of Composer, uh, just, just in case not everybody in the room is familiar with it. Um, so Composer is a, a tool for dependency management in PHP. It allows you to declare libraries your project depends on and it will manage and install and update them for you. And how we want to use it, how it helps Drupal, is it will allow Core, Core is using it now to pull in libraries from all over the, um, from packages and other things, you know, it, it let us get off the island in ways that we didn't have to invent every single piece of code that Drupal is going to be dependent upon. And soon it will allow contrib developers to also use those non-Drupal uh, non libraries in their, in their modules. And the facade allows us to have site construction using Drupal modules and themes that are proudly invented here. So. Um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. So the Composer facade, uh, what is it? It's, it's an officially supported service from the Drupal.org infrastructure that provides the metadata the Composer can use to declare dependencies on Drupal modules and themes. So it's essentially serving as a replacement for a community bu built tool that's uh, packages.drupalcomposer.org. Uh, how many of you are familiar with that? Like, using, okay, great, we've got a lot of, a lot of folks in here who know that. We're all just waiting for you. <laughs> um, does the transitions work this way too? Okay, cool. So uh, just a, another real high level of, you know, how the ecosystem sort of works. You've got uh, a composer repository, which the default is packages.org, or if you're using uh, Drupal Composer, uh, or packages.drupalcomposer.org, and then you've got code somewhere else like GitHub or Bitbucket. Normally a developer posts new code and it triggers a hook to go update all the metadata on packages.org so that the information about which version it is and what its dependencies are are located on Packagist. And then from the command line, a user is able to say, I want to require, say, guzzle HTTP as a library into my project. They can say, compose a require guzzle. Composer is going to connect to that packages repository, download all the metadata for Guzzle, parse it apart, figure out what its dependencies are, and figure out what else Guzzle needs, and along with everything else in your project, figure, determine what it needs to download, then it'll go and get all the different components that it needs from GitHub or Bitbucket or wherever else they're stored, whether it's a Git checkout or a tarball. And so the Composer facade that Drupal.org is supporting is essentially the same thing, except we've got our Drupal.org project database and our Git repos, since everything's stored on Drupal.org, 
and it's going to act as the metadata repository for all of the um, all of the Drupal projects and modules and themes. And so, of course, you add new commits, it updates the facade. You want to add, say, the token module to your project. You say composer require Drupal token. And then the composer command line interface is going to hit the composer facade, get all the metadata, and download stuff from Drupal.org. So it works essentially the same way. Uh, and if you're using all of this will be part of how a um, how it would work in the future. It'll be pulling stuff from packages, it'll be pulling stuff from our facade to build your entire site. So this is this is kind of my favorite slide. Like why why did we do this? Why did we build this? Why didn't we just use packages? Why didn't you know there's um, a lot of a lot of questions are surrounding that. And so one of the main ones is you know there's a big difference in the data model between packages which have a one-to-one -one relationship between I need this package and it's in this Git repository. And so a package and a Git repository are essentially the same thing and you depend upon that package. But Drupal has projects and it has modules inside of those projects. Sometimes the modules and the projects are the same thing, like say the rules module. You have the rules project and the rules module inside of it and it's equivalent. Sometimes you have things like the features extra module which there's no features extra module, it's just a project, but within it there are separate submodules that are not named the same way. So in order to support these submodules and have dependencies on these submodules, if you only need one part of a, a module, we needed to find a way to translate our data model into something that mapped one to one with what packages would do. So we also wanted to have comprehensive support for all D7 and D8 modules out of the gate. So there was, there was some talk of, well, we can organically move it forward, um, but that requires everyone to submit their own composer JSON, and that would require packages to come and parse that, and it would be kind of a slow process before modules would be available. And we were like, well, we have all the metadata that we need without the composer JSON, so we can, we can do this on our side without requiring, um, uh, without requiring a, a slow process. We can have it out of the gates. Another issue that we were facing is the one of semantic versioning. Um, Contrib doesn't have semantic versioning right now, but Composer really needs semantic versioning. It's a valuable way that you can have a, a dependency on a module and updates can happen to that module and you know that if it's a patch level release, it probably it should not break any APIs and you should be able to just upgrade to it to get your security releases or get bug fixes. And if there's new APIs, you should be able to depend on those and our our version mapping didn't map very cleanly to what Composer wanted. Because we have our human readable versions because we have different platforms. We've got seven, we've got Drupal eight. And it's really useful for us to say, well, this is the seven X module or this is the eight X module, but it has the same 2.0 branch and they have our feature complete between the two things. But that didn't map very well to Composer's concept of here's a package and it does this thing regardless of what platform you're working on. Additionally, there's usage data that takes place. Whenever someone uses Composer, it updates a, uh, the endpoint and says, hey, I'm downloading this. And so we use that usage data whenever people download modules, whenever there's update stats, all of that feeds into, you know, what are the top 40 modules? What are the modules that are important? What are the modules we need to make sure get upgraded to Drupal 9 or, you know, those sorts of information. So we didn't want to lose access to any of that usage data. We wanted that to keep coming back to Drupal.org. Finally, uh, or well, additionally, project discovery. We didn't want there to be multiple places for people to find where to find modules. You know, go to packages and look for Drupal modules, go to Drupal.org and look for Drupal modules and the information might get out of sync. We wanted it all to be in one place on, on Drupal.org itself. Um, and additionally, we have a distributed infrastructure. Um, I was talking to someone recently about they were using the packages DrupalComposer.org and also Packagist and they're, those only exist in one place globally right now and people in Asia have a real hard time with the latency of trying to, de you know, trying to resolve all their dependencies because it adds an extra 500 milliseconds and there's a lot of HTTP requests that take place. And so this allowed us to build this and put it behind our Fastly CDN right out of the gates because we already had 
the infrastructure in place for the CDN. And so it's already distributed. And uh, I've already heard reports from some people that it's like it sped them up considerably. Um, all right, so speaking of versions, this is just kind of a map of how we decided to map our current versions to the existing versions. And it's relatively simple. We just, for the composer JSON files and then the metadata, we're just dropping our notion of platform and we're adding an additional zero in for a patch level um, thing. So a 7.34 beta 2 becomes 3.4.0. And what this will allow us to do is we'll be able to add an additional patch level version to contrib without having to remove the 7.x on Drupal.org. We can still have the human readable notion of like, well, this is a 7 module, this is an 8 module, but the machine readable version is fits with pure semantic versioning. So um, one thing that we have to kind of note is that Drupal historically has supported unstable as a type of not quite ready release, and the rest of the world supports alpha, beta, RC, and full releases. And so unstable and alpha are essentially the same thing, so we're kind of wanting to deprecate unstable as a as a type of release. Um, ah, yeah, that, that's coming right here. So how to use our endpoint. So we've got full documentation on Drupal.org at that link. And if you want to add this to your Composer JSON, it's packages.drupal.org slash eight and packages.drupal.org slash seven. And we are offering two separate endpoints so that the semantic versioning works so that there isn't any confusion inside of your modules, like which one is it trying to download. It's actually getting the metadata for either the Drupal 8 module version or the Drupal 7 module version. And this is just, you know, what the JSON looks like in, inside. It's a new composer repository. It'll try that one first, and then if it can't find it, it'll go to packages. Um, is. So using our endpoint from Composer, once you have that in your project, you should be able to say Composer require Drupal and the module name and then the version constraint that you need for that module if you want to lock it down to whatever versions. And that should add Drupal modules to your project. Um, additionally, we've implemented a couple of features. Oh, wait. We've, there's a couple of other Composer features that are also supported. Like if you do a Composer search, it's going to hit our search API and hit our solar servers and respond with stuff that Composer can understand. And then Composer Browse works as well. So if you're just like, I want to go straight to the project page, you can just type Composer Browse Drupal slash token. I remember. One of the things I'd like to point out is like, when you're doing a Composer require Drupal slash module name, that could be the project name or it could be the sub-module name. Like say you, you have a project that you just need to use just the rules mod, or you need just the MC API module, which is a mutual credit API. The project is called mutual underscore credit, but you can require either of those. And it's a, uh, in Composer it's a meta package. So it basically says, oh, this is a sub-module. We're gonna go up one level higher and download the, the full package because, again, this is that translation between our, we have a Git repository that holds multiple modules, but you might only want to express dependencies on individual modules. So I'm not sure what best practices are just going to reveal whether or not it's better to try and say compose required Drupal slash project name or whether it's going to end up being better to say com compose required Drupal slash individual module name. That, that'll probably be more like, they're both supported, but we'll find out whether one or the other is probably better. Um, so if you're a project maintainer and you want to add uh, a requirement on another module, you can say, well, my, my project requires token and I need at least the uh, 1.0 version of token for Drupal 8. And so this is what you would add to your composer JSON in your module. One thing to note is you, you will need to have this here, but you also want to still express your dependencies in the info.yaml file because core is still going to look at info.yaml to see what's your dependencies and what's your dependency constraints. And so you probably want to have these match. Now the composer facade is actually going to look at whether or not you have a composer JSON and whether or not you have and what you have in your info file. And it's going to join that information together 
and it's going to, for the requires, it's going to use what's in the info file because um, that's, since Drupal needs that, it's going to default to that. Um, but for all other data fields, it's going to default to what's in the composer JSON. So if you've got projects on packages, DrupalComposer.org, you should be able to just drop the major version for all your requirements, the, either the eight or the seven, and then add a zero at the end of those version numbers. So if you had 8.1.0, it becomes 1.0.0. And then you want to change the URL to um, ours instead of the uh, packages Drupal Composer. So what's missing, what's next, what else do we need to make this just fully supported to make it a really nice clean thing? We want a subtree split of Drupal core because there's core, well there's Drupal the project, but then there's core which is the code base. And oftentimes you don't want the same front controller, you don't want to use the HT access, you're, you're on Nginx and you don't need all the stuff that it comes with, so you want to use just the core of Drupal and maybe you have a project that's not even going to be running Drupal, but you just want to have access to a whole lot of the Drupal libraries, so you can include Drupal core. So we want to get a subtree split of that going. Additionally, we want to have a subtree split of the Drupal components. So there's several components in, the, in Drupal 8 that have a composer JSON associated with them that you should be able to use completely independently from Drupal. And a good example of that is in Drupal CI, we're using the plugin architecture from Drupal 8. And right now we can't pull in that plugin architecture. We're literally copying and pasting it every once in a while to get that into our project. And so we're, you know, we want to use it on Drupal CI. Um, we'd like to add distributions and install profiles as a thing to support so that you can say Composer require uh, an install profile as a baseline to start with a lot of, essentially a distribution works like a meta package in that sort of that sort of realm, but we don't, we don't have that baked in yet. Patches, right now there isn't a real good way to add patches to Composer, or rather not out of the box. There's a module that uh, Cameron, a um, Drupal community member has written that allows you to add patches to make Composer work a little bit more like Drush Make. Um, that's, I think that's built into Webflow, Florian's, um, Drupal project scaffold setup. Um, we want to switch Drupal CI over to using Composer for its dependency management. Right now Drupal CI has a problem that we're running off of uh, project dependencies and project dependency is having a hard time figuring out dev versions and whether or not they're specific versions. So especially right now in the Drupal 8 release cycle when people are working on contrib modules and well my contrib module depends on the alpha version of token or a dev version of token, it's hard for people to test specific and exact versions. And so we want to switch Drupal CI over to using Composer to figure out which dependencies it needs to download. And, and that would, you know, as soon as we have that, it'll make it a lot easier for people to test exactly what they want. There are still some um, version issues in some Composer JSONs. Uh, Path Auto is one that comes to mind where they have put dependencies on other modules in their composer JSON using the packages.drupalcomposer.org versioning scheme. So there's like dependencies on 8.1. something. So there, we should open a few issues if we see composer JSONs that have that. Uh, I can probably just automatically do that or something, but we'll want we'll to migrate those over to using the official one versioning. Um, there's still some complications when using dev versions because the Composer facade does not provide a dist tarball for the dev versions because we don't, if you're using prefer, if you're using prefer dist, then you want to download all the tarballs unless it's a dev version, then you want to get a clone of it and lock it at that hash. That way your Composer lock file is, actually has, you know, well I had that dev version, that dev version works and it doesn't become a moving target. So we removed dist from the dev versions, but whenever you clone something, it doesn't get that version into the info file because packaging is normally what does that. And so there is a, um, there is a, oh I, I meant to put this in the slide. Uh, Florian has something called composer deploy that works kind of like git deploy does and it pulls information out of the metadata that we're providing 
to which dev version you've downloaded so it can be added to the info file. So that's a, uh, another thing. So um, does anybody have any questions on everything I've talked about so far? Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I guess I have a basic question. I'm a little bit confused in the composer world, but excited about it at the same time. So I'm getting my module distributed from the, the, the composer site. Does that like totally change where and how it gets installed and stuff like that? Or does that like stay the same? Contrib or custom, those kinds of games? Um, there's, it, it's sort of a limitation of the way Composer works. There's a, um, there's installers that are plugins to um, Composer itself. And so when we, when we provide the metadata, we say this is a Drupal module, and it'll put it in the, um, I believe it cites all modules directory. But there's, um, I don't, that, that, that's something that still needs to be solved, is to figure out how to, like say you had a multi-site and you wanted it to go to different places, it, that, that's still sort of an issue of like. But it's not gonna stuff it in the vendor folder. No, it does not, it won't put it in the vendor folder. It, it knows it's a Drupal module and it'll put it in the Drupal module location. Plug in and it'll ask you to put it where you want it. Right, and, and you can specify in your composer JSON where, where things go as well. Um, it, the namespace was locked down so nobody else can add anything to it and there wasn't a whole lot of modules. I mean, yeah, we, we should go and make sure it gets cleaned up so that people don't end up with the wrong version, you know, but I, I, it seems like a lot of those are like the Drupal console is on there and Drush is on there, but those also kind of, um, kind of fall outside of the realm of modules and themes as well. So. But yeah, we can definitely look on packages to make sure it's not um, too polluted with multiple versions of the same thing. Yeah, Trezo is the namespace, right? Yeah, I think Trezo is the namespace now, so. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Are all real projects that are built in there by default full listed in that folder? Yeah, full, full, full projects are listed in there. And depending on which version constraints you put on there, it'll, it depends on which version you'll get of it. It won't do sandboxes. No, it won't do sandboxes right now. Hello. Uh, great presentation, by the way. Oh, thanks. Um, tag team this one. Yeah, do you want to start with that? I'll start with it. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> You're fighting between what I'm going to say, so. Yeah, yeah, because. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, I've actually been doing a lot of research on this. Uh, it, I, I consider the, the first two years of having a dedicated technical team for Drupal.org that, that are paid staff working on it full time as, kind of a lesson in fire hose discovery. I mean, somebody pointing a fire hose at you and just flooding you with lots and lots of information. Early, early on, whenever I, I, I came on and started building up the team, I was like, I was getting a lot of, well, when are you gonna move to, to GitHub? Like, when is that gonna happen? Um, to give a bit of context, the, the great Git migration where we moved off of Subversion, that was a two-year project. It took... Yeah, we were even older. I, I, yeah, I don't know why I said Subversion, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. The, the, 
The, the examples, uh, actually I, I can't give an example with Subversion. WordPress is still on Subversion. They take pull requests from GitHub, but they run their own Subversion infrastructure because migrating off of it would be a huge endeavor. Uh, the Linux Foundation still uses um, Git and a patch-based workflow with CLI tools and email. They use patches and they email them back and forth to each other. Like really big projects, it's difficult to do one of these migrations. That's not to say it shouldn't be done. In fact, uh, I, I really do believe that there are GitHub integrations we should do. Um, but as Dries mentioned the other day, whenever it came up in the, the, the keynote uh, question to him, it would mean having to refactor quite a few things, like issue credits. Uh, everything I showed you in issue credits requires that we're using comments on issues in order for us to even provide that information about the community. Um, could we come up with some sort of deal with GitHub where we can build in some sort of integration and do some automatic things? Maybe, and, and that, that's definitely some stuff to look at, but those are big projects. That, that great Git migration off of CVS uh, to, um, did you like how I reiterated that? To, to Git, to your project, you know, you're talking about a year of discussion, uh, a good six months of a few people moving it forward a little bit, and then a good solid six months of let's throw some like contractor time at this and get it over the finish line. That typical two-year project for the community has always been the norm. Something like Composer, frankly, it would have taken that long for us to deploy a Composer endpoint if we had done it the old way. Um, having dedicated people working full time on it and, and having them inter interact with core maintainers and with key contrib maintainers that are already in that space was helpful. GitHub is infinitesimally bigger. Um, it would replace about four services out of 20 or so collaboration services that we use. Those four services though have 16 integration points that would have to be refactored. 12 of them would absolutely be uh, critical to kind of how we do our workflow. So it, it's not a, a thing to take on lightly, uh, even though we'd love to do it. And I, I think what we'll probably end up doing, honestly, is we'll end up coming with some sort of um, contrib interaction where you can more easily uh, clone your, your, your contrib-based GitHub project and you can pull it into the Drupal.org repository so that we can have all the project, project browsing and composer facade and everything else. I, I think there's something there that's a, a nice um, middle ground, a compromise. And then uh, Ryan also has done some great presentations on the possibility of taking our, our, the way we do core and even some of the bigger contrib projects and moving it to like a, uh, a more pull request-like workflow that matched the Drupal community a little bit more. And those are some great ideas that I think we should still continue to explore. But the race isn't over yet. GitHub's big, I want their contributors. I absolutely, because of JavaScript and everything else, I think it's, it's gonna be necessary, but we're gonna have to figure out a way to do it while still retaining some of what makes Drupal Drupal. Absolutely. I have trained a lot of people in the place I work for in Drupal, and when we talk about contributing and creating patches, applying patches, that's really something that scares people off. You know, actually, a, a, an interesting um, workaround to, to, from a training perspective that I think would be interesting for some mentors to do is when they're teaching people how to create patches. Uh, most people don't know this, but for every pull request you create on GitHub, there's a special hidden URL where you just add dot .patch to it. And you've got your patch file. Just upload that to Drupal.org, and you've, you've you've just fixed the process of them not understanding how to create it. Like, there's some workarounds we can do in the meantime, and I know they're workarounds and they're they're irritating and not as smooth, but they're really necessary because of all these great tools we do have, like Drupal CI, now the Composer uh, endpoints, all of the project browsing stuff, our usage stats. Like, all of these things depend on our Git repos, and so whatever we come up with, we we. We're going to have to keep part of that. There's no cost savings or even like mind share savings of not spending the time thinking about it by moving over to GitHub because it's actually harder than what we have right now. It's just not easy. It's not. It's definitely not easier to contribute to. So we're trying to figure out that middle ground and that compromise. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? 
<laughs> no, I was, I was going to let him talk, but... Oh, I, I was just going to mention that, you know, we came up with some ideas um, a, a while back for issue workspaces, and just other priorities have pushed it off on the, off the roadmap, and we're not sure where it lands yet right now, but there, are, there is architecture and design for how we can improve it on Drupal.org if we don't do a wholesale move to GitHub or, you know, there's, it, it, it's another option on the table. It's something that's session in L.A. Yeah, I, yeah, I gave it. Yeah. Yeah. He was wearing fancier clothes then. <laughs> Hey, come on, I got Bigfoot. Yeah, you do have Bigfoot. <laughs> you were wearing plaid pants. Yeah. I mean, come on. You might be surprised. What? You might be surprised. On, 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 on page one of the marketplace right now, uh, there are no less than five companies that have fewer than 10 people. So, so the, the amount, how, how is it calculated? It's, it's issue credits over. For, for me, for, for me yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's primarily comments. If you do a patch or a comment, if you're participating in the issue, you have an opportunity per each issue to have one credit. So you might have a larger company that has three people participating in an issue, and three people will get credits, but that larger company is only going to get one issue credit. Um, so that actually does help with the percentages-based thing. Um, it, it, there, there is a skew to a couple of companies that have just an incredible amount of resources that they're pushing towards it, and that definitely keeps them in the top 10. But if you're talking about the top 25, there's a company that I saw in the top 25 within the last six months that had three people. It only takes about 30 issue credits to show up on the first page. Now, that may change as more people get used to it and start using it and whatnot. I think the challenge then will be figure out ways to segment the marketplace so that people who are looking for a Drupal shop are picking the right size Drupal shop for their project and, and being able to identify that. And that's, that's more kind of UI around how we do that listing rather than what are the top contributors. Because if we start doing it by percentages, we skew it in a different way and it just it hurts things a different way. And, so. and I just want to add, it's, it's difficult because a lot of larger companies will also, like their, their front desk staff will sign up for an account on Drupal.org, be, um, be part of their company and buy tickets for their employees for DrupalCon and that's their only activity. But then it starts to be credit. like percentage of whom, you know, yeah. you, you might end up with a lot of people who aren't going to be getting issue credits, but they still have accounts on Drupal.org, and maybe they're just reading documentation, or maybe they're doing something else, or, you know, a company with a lot of juniors versus a lot of seniors. So it, it's hard to figure out how do you, percentage of which type of contributors yeah, is. Mm -hmm. uh, but you about it, uh, 
Yeah, there, there's a there's an issue on Drupal.org. I'll, I'll add it to the slide deck so that I can make sure that people can get to it. So uh, when we post our slides afterwards you'll, and add that to the uh, the session, you'll be able to, to see where that's at. But there is an issue where I've kind of talked about all the different types of contribution that we know about, whether or not we currently collect the information, whether or not we currently display the information, and whether or not it would be possible to display the information at some time. And it's a huge list. We're talking about 100 different contribution activities that you could be doing, everything from contributing documentation to running a camp to uh, being a sprint mentor to speaking at a camp, speaking at a con, like all of these things. There, there's a lot of really powerful contributions. We started with issue credits because if you're looking at Drupal 8 and getting it released, it was the most important thing to do. Uh, now, we're still in that phase right now with Drupal 8 module upgrades. I, I, I don't think we're out of that phase yet, but I think as we add more things to the profiles and we make a richer picture of contribution, we're absolutely going to be looking for some of these edge, ca edge cases uh, that aren't really edge cases. They're the stress cases that Sarah was talking about this morning. They're the opportunity to really highlight some of the pain points in the community and highlight people who are doing great things. but. Uh, frankly, if, if we just have subjective information on their profile, they're never going to show up anywhere. We have to figure out a way to make that data objective, and then we can uh, truly show it and, and highlight them. I, I just want to add one more thing, and it's, I just find it fascinating when I see signs in places, and it says drilling holes on lecterns is prohibited. Oh, wow. There That's must have been a lot of hole drilling for them to require that <laughs> sign. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Uh, I can't think of a better way to end the presentation than that. <laughs>